Sorry. No, you're good. Um, and so within that, uh, you know, understanding w what the benefits are of playing isolation, you know, you know, two sets in front, one behind, making that middle blocker choose what she's going to do and, and those types of things. Um, and as long as the players had a better understanding of what they were trying to do, they were far more successful. And, and you know, for us, we kind of flip back and forth between isolate and overload. Uh, we played a little bit around with the back row attack, but we honestly weren't as successful as that as I would have liked to have been. Uh, something we were practicing a lot this spring until, you know, uh, all this stuff went sideways. And now we're all trying to get better, um, you know, on the coaching side. But so for us, the, the in-system, out-of-system, having a plan and making sure your players understand what your in-system offense is trying to accomplish. Um, and then for blocking, again, it was, you know, it's, it's one of the ways to score points. It's an important skill. Um, you know, and statistically, you're looking at attack percentage is most important, uh, kill percentage is second most important, and then block stuff is third. Block stuff is actually ahead of attack errors. Um, so for us, it was teaching our kids how to understand what we want to do blocking wise, giving them sound techniques, making sure they had a picture of what it should look like when it's done right. Uh, so when we watch film, they can you know, see when they're doing it right, see when they're doing wrong. And, and we try and show them a lot of positive things on film, showing them doing it right so then they can just try and copy it. Um, I, I'm a really firm believer in teaching. Coaching is just teaching and educating. Um, and I think in order to help kids be successful, you've got to catch them when they're doing it right. Um, you know, you've got to catch them when they're making the right move or their hand placement's in the right spot and praise them for it. And then they're going to want to do it again and again. Um, Back errors, we didn't worry too much about them at first because, again, we're trying to generate points. And I think a lot of times kids get conservative when they're trying to attack and they're afraid to really go for it and, and let loose. Uh, so I, I, in practice, I, I don't even worry about errors. Uh, you know, we have a couple of games that the errors teach them themselves because it costs them points, but we don't worry about it too much. I really – I praise velocity. Uh, I – I pray it's being creative, uh, setters being creative, attackers being creative, what shots are there, are they setting themselves up for future shots? You know, if you're beating a middle back to the 1-6 side in that scene, and then you see your start to scoot over, and then you hit the 5-6, you set that up for yourself. Uh, so I really encourage that and praise that a lot. Uh, you know, and then in terms for us, pieces was lastly on the list. And if you looked at our season stats from the fall, you would you would absolutely see that. Uh, we were one of the bottom two or three teams in our conference serving uh, for aces. Uh, and the reason being is we felt our dig-to-kill transition was really good that we didn't want to miss serves. Um, we didn't want to take those opportunities away. We were also, depending on the week, you know, second through fourth in blocking the league. So we wanted to give our blockers a chance uh, to score points for us. So missing serves from the service line for us was was not in the cards. We our goal was to miss one or less per set. Uh, so really playing to play volleyball. Uh, we like to think ourselves as a, a, a really a skill team. I call it the whole volleyball team, but you know we weren't super powerful, uh, but we played the game really well. Everyone on my team could set. Everyone could serve. Almost everyone could dig. Um, and but we could play the game of volleyball, and so we really, really focused on that. And so we didn't want to take away, uh, you know, opportunities by making silly errors, serving out when we didn't have to. Okay, Tim, give me one second so, here. So everyone, everyone that's on, if you want if the questions, uh, if you look to your right on the on the um, dashboard, you'll see there's a question. If you have questions, uh, Tim's going to answer them towards the end. But uh, I just a couple of people came in late, and I just want to just reiterate, uh, you had talked about uh, in system out of system was a big, big number for you last year and switching up. So what specifically were you doing in practices to train that out of system? Was the setter just getting every first ball? But you also said you had you gave the the out of system five shots. Could, can you share those with us, or would you rather not? Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, so first and foremost, we do we do practice in kind of a block 
Uh, we do a positional breakout for about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, in which we'll have, you know, passers passing, setter setting, middles, doing block footwork and transition routes. Um, and so what we did to train the out of system in that is for 10 minutes of that first block, we would have a non-setter come in. You know, this is after we're warmed up and all that sort of stuff. This is mm -hmm. the first, like, training block of practice. We'd have a non-setter come in and set for – five to ten minutes sometimes we switch it out so it'd be five minutes of one kid and five minutes of another sometimes it'd be ten minutes of just one kid and we would give our pin hitters because that's mostly who all your out of system balls are going to is left front or right front um two shots to work on that week uh and so the five total shots was it was if you're on the left side so hit in position four uh non-setter sets you you can tool off the right front blocker and out of bounds towards the sideline you can tool off the middle blocker's right hand and have that go high and deep and flat over the end line. Um, it's kind of high, deep, and flat shot, uh, and you're getting that deflection. So that's the second. And then we'd hit it clean to zone 5-6 or clean to 1-6. So both the deep seams. And then we added clean to 6 uh, just specifically because we looked at our conference and a lot of teams play rotation defense. So they'd have right back playing underneath for the tip. They'd scoot their middle back over towards the line and leave that middle back area exposed. Hmm. So we taught our kids how to hit it. Um, and that, that would be in the breakout. And then as we progress through practice, we would practice our out-of-system blocking, and we'd bring blockers over to, to block in that same training situation. And then we would do a, an out-of-system drill that, that I took from SC and from Mick Haley. Uh, we called it Battlestar over there, but basically it's six on six. You enter first ball at the setter, uh, and that team is obviously out of system, and then they just play. Um, and the, you enter uh, four balls total, two to each side, and if the score is tied, each side gets a bonus ball, and you keep playing until there's a winner. And then I don't do really lineups when we do that. I just let everyone play their natural position, split squad and let him keep rotating through, and we keep track of winners and losers. Uh, and, like, the, the bottom two point getters, so if, if you've been on the, the losing team a lot and you haven't earned a lot of points, you'll have, you know, extra serving practice at the end or extra wall sprints or something like that every day. Um, we set everything competitively when it comes to – when we go six on six, winning and losing matters, um, no matter what the drill is. So that, that was, for us, the out-of-system training. Uh, so we did it specifically with the, with the pin hitters practicing the different shots, and we'd add a shot to it. Uh, and we ended up, by the end of it, we had a lot of shots. Uh, we could hit sharp four to four um, out-of-system. We could hit high and deep and flat to five. We didn't, the kids jokingly, they had a cheer on the bench. They'd call it one of five every time we scored on an out-of-system ball. Uh, and... Uh, by the end of the season, they were chanting like, one of 20, one of 20, uh, just because we kept adding wrinkles to it. Uh, and the kids got comfortable with it. And it's one of those things that, that feeds itself on the momentum. You know, they see it work one or two times, and then they get excited about it, and then they believe it can work every time, and so then they're executing it at a higher level, and it just snowballs on itself. So from so the previous year to this season, or this past season, sorry, in 2019, that was those were the biggest differences was just the out of system the blocking and then just the as you said the point scoring you just became very really intentional with training certain players of what their point scoring opportunities would be is that correct yeah yeah no that's correct the out of system attacking number for sure uh that was night and day um uh, and then we moved up in the conference standings and point scored to i'd have to look into the final we were in the top you know, one, two, or three the whole season in it. Um, but, uh, and, and I think the largely, again, it was the out of system giving each attacker a plan. They know they can hit one of these five shots. One of them's going to work. You know, if they hit two of them and they haven't worked, they just keep going down the line until they get to the one that's going to work. Um, and they know that, that they're always doing the right thing uh, doing that. And then in system wise, it was really getting our kids to understand what are we trying to do in system? You know, whether we're trying to isolate blockers or overload blockers or flood zones. And within that, 
instance, we understand what we're trying to do, they can see when it's not working and they kind of start to figure out why. Um, so they start answering their own questions before they even get to me. You know, it's, a, it's that whole educating, teaching them the whole game, not just, oh, you only do this, just do this. You know, we kind of really want to teach them our systemic approach uh, so they can help coach themselves and coach other kids in their position. Yeah. So are you swing blocking or, or uh, at all or just straight blocking? What are you doing? Yeah. So we are absolutely a swing block team. We're a bunch read team. Um, and then we, we swing block everywhere. Uh, we even were practicing triple blocking this past spring early. Um, unfortunately, losing most of our spring season, I don't think we're going to get enough time to get it all the way in uh, for next fall, but you never know. We'll see. Um, but I like the swing block move. Um, I think it allows the kids to be a little more athletic. It allows them to use the same type of footwork they would use on their approach. Um, you know, so I think that that was good for us. And, you know, reading is a big part of blocking, whether you're static blocking or swing blocking. Um, so working on the eye sequencing and the reading, just what they're supposed to be watching uh, and in what order they're watching things. Okay. And how do you work on that in practice? Just, just playing? Uh, no, we do. So in our training blocks, after we go through that first block, we'll do a second block where we mix positions around. The liberos will do defense. And then we'll add uh, pin blockers alongside our middle blockers. And we'll work on everything from footwork patterns to hand positions to, um, you know, we call it loading up, but preloading when we know we can eliminate options. So we're reading the play and the pass doesn't allow the setter to back set. It allows our middle to cheat. It allows our right front to not worry about the middle blocker as much. And she can kind of load up to get out to the pin, things like that. So it, a lot of it's, uh, you know, I'm going to steal a term cards used in, in pattern recognition, but just eliminating options, um, seeing what's happening on the other side and knowing what can and can't happen and only preparing for what can happen. Um, you know that and again that we did it every day and then we play six on sixes with it um yeah. and you can tweak your six on sixes to so that your scoring emphasizes what you train that day you know so if we're doing a six on six drill and our out of system attacking emphasize you know tooling the outside hand off the blocker we'll give a you know an extra point if that happens in the sixes um if we're working on you know left front helping on the quick uh, and we get they get a block in that in six on six. We'll give them an extra point if left front helps on the quick. So you can change your six on six drills and your scoring to help emphasize what you trained and drilled throughout the week, the month, what, you know, whatever your learning cycle is. Yeah. So I and I've heard Coach talk, uh, Cards talk about this before, but can you go into a little bit more specifics about the elimination, the idea of elimination on the blocking? Yeah. I mean. First and foremost, I think kids watch the ball way too much. Um, I think the only thing you're really trying to see off the ball, off that very first contact, is is it coming over the net? After that, the ball doesn't do anything without somebody manipulating it. You know, you're looking at the setter, where her hands are. Are they high in her head? Are they out front? Are they behind her head? Is she arching her back? Is she off balance? Um, you know, is there middle blocker in a route? I can't tell you how many times uh, – I've watched film and just watching middles holding super tight on the other middle who's not even approaching uh, instead of figuring out, okay, where can it go? Um, so as you can, you know, you get through your eye sequence, your progression, you can eliminate things that can and can't happen. If the middle's not in a route, she can't get set. Uh, if the pass is far enough off the net, you can, you know, reduce the odds the middle's going to get set. Maybe your middle blocker can drop her hands down so she's in a, more athletic position to get to a pin um you know uh just watching the setter is she bump setting if she's bump setting forget about the middle you should be loading up um and it's not just the blockers that have to read it i think that's a really big misconception too um i think the defenders behind it need to be watching the play and again it, it's there's no secret formula it's learning to see things as they're happening and just recognize oh this is not a possibility anymore. This is not a possibility anymore. So just eliminating the options that are no longer there and only worrying about what they can actually do. 
Yeah. Uh, Jordan wants to know what kind of time do you spend giving feedback to pin blockers in six on six? Since pins have so many other responsibilities that have high point uh, score yield and reception attack. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends on what day of the week it is, honestly, and what training phase we're in. In preseason, uh, we're going to give feedback a lot to them uh, when we're not playing that week. Um, if we're in the middle of regular conference season, it's going to be less during six on six. And it's going to be a lot more during film review after, you know, we'll cut up film of practice. We'll put it up on our, our cloud storage for our kids to log in and they can watch it when they want. And we'll leave little notes. Hey, you did this really well. You know, you helped on the quick here as well as, you know, getting out to your left front attacker or whatever it might be. Um, I tend to talk less and less on sixes about that as the season goes on. Uh, because as the season goes on and we're doing sixes, I want kids to worry more about competing. Uh, I don't want them second guessing what they're doing or questioning their decisions. I want them competing and playing in the moment. Because the reality in sport is no matter what just happened, the only moment you can affect is the one you're in. Um, and so we want our kids constantly living in the moment and playing that point, that rally, that contact. Um, you know, that coverage or that away from ball movement. Uh, so then we save a lot of that feedback as the season progresses, as we do it in film, um, you know, whether it's match film, practice film, whatever that might be. Did your style as a coach or your philosophy as a coach change from a couple years ago to last season? Or has it pretty much been the same and you just got some players that kind of fit the system you wanted to run or a little of both? I think a little of both. I think that, uh, you know, I think I'm always learning and evolving, and I try and learn from all my assistants and acquaintances. And, you know, I know that I'm not the smartest guy in the room, uh, and I always want to learn. And for me, sports is sport. I don't care. I'll go to basketball practices, baseball, soccer. It doesn't matter. Just watching how coaches organize and lead their teams and communicate effectively uh, is a great teaching tool. Um, you know, I think my, I've done a better job as I've been a head coach at learning how to communicate with my entire roster, not just the, you know, four or five kids that maybe I was positionally coaching that day. I think that's something that we've really been intentional about the last couple of years is making sure that we're really interacting and, and not just coaching, but interacting more with the entire roster, you know, from your top kid down to, you know, number 18 or, or however many you're carrying. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really important because every kid is really valuable and they all contribute and you need them all to win on different nights. Uh, and so if they don't feel like you're as invested, maybe you're not going to get their best stuff one night really needed. Yeah, and, and that's one of the keys, obviously, in a sport that plays six and has 12 to 18 on a bench, right? You've got to keep those those other players. So are you, what specifics are you doing with them? Are you having extra meetings with them? Are you just giving them a pat on the back of practice and telling them, I notice you, I know what you're doing, good things? What do you do? Um, I No, I think it has to be far more than that. Uh, so I do a – I meet with players every single day. Um, not every player. So I'll meet, uh, I'll meet with – each player, probably every other face-to-face uh, -face in my office, uh, a, to talk non-volleyball even, checking in on family, academics, make sure they don't have any questions or concerns, but just really spending time with them. Um, and then throughout the week, you know, I'll send them text messages after practice or, or upload video for them just saying, hey, I saw this, this was awesome, a great job, or, you know, I got our academics report and, and you know, you're carrying a 397, that's awesome, keep it up. But just the, the constant thing so that they know that they're appreciated. Um, you know, they put in a ton of time and effort. In fact, they put in as much time and effort as everyone else. They have to be valued and treated that way. Um, and I don't think that I've ever valued them differently. I just think I've gotten a little bit better at having a cleaner line of communication with them. Mm -hmm. What about the, the X's and O's? Have you have you – seen some changes i mean you, you know we're going back 13 14 15 years when you were at pepperdine and then you know and then you go to play you know coach with mick and stuff and now you got your own gig it, the x's and o's have, have have you changed a little bit on those kind of ideas those kind of those kind of things 
Yeah, I mean, I think the game has evolved certainly in those 13, 14 years. I think that, uh, you know, everyone's playing faster. We certainly are as well. Uh, I think, but I think a lot of it is cyclical, you know, it's, it's trends, you know. Before, everyone played real high and slow. Uh, not everyone, but most teams played high and slow. Then they got real fast, and everyone's real fast. I think eventually it's going to go back. Um, I, I think the game, you always have to keep adapting. If you're not willing to adapt, your people are going to pass you. You know, for me, I, I don't have a particular style that I'm like, this is it. It has to be me. For me, if I look at my roster and I say, hey, these are our strengths, how do I maximize them? Um, you know, I, I think certainly our ball control and our setting is a strength next year. And so we are going to use that to be intricate and be very specific at different things. Um, you know, if we have to play high ball next year, we're not going to be as successful as we could be. So we're going to rely on our, our strength, you know, our ball control and our setting to put us in great situations and give our kids the best possible chances to score points. Yeah. Way smarter people than me have said often that, you know, you learn more from your failures and your losses than you do your wins and successes. Um, you know, you, you had a, you had a rough few, first few years at Grand Canyon, but the, what what did you learn uh, from those years? But also the success that you had at USC, um, you know, getting to some national, you know, national semifinal games. That's a pretty impressive feat, you know, out of 300 something schools. But the, the highs and the lows, what have you taken from both of those? And, and now, now you're using and you're coaching. Um, you know, I think the SC taught me a lot. Um, you know, the, the structure and the practice planning, uh, looking ahead. I mean, we plan out 18 months in ahead in, in my office. Uh, just because you have to be ready for it. You never want to be playing catch up. You want to be a step ahead. Uh, it doesn't always work, but you got to try and be. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the highs from that, the planning ahead, and it never stops. There's no day off. You know, the day you take off is the day someone's out recruiting. Um, I think uh, for my first couple years at Grand Canyon, it was learning how hard it is to, to feel momentum and movement. Um, and so we had to find things we could measure that would show the girls when we were doing it right, because it wasn't always in the win and loss category, uh, even though we wanted it to be, because I am the most competitive person, and it drove me nuts that we couldn't win every night. Um, but the fact was, is, is we were hurt. Uh, we were, you know, just building. And it took those teams to have the team in the year we had last year. Without those first two years, we wouldn't have had it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think that, being an effective communicator, uh, understanding that culture is super important because, you know, as coaches, we're not there all the time. We're not with them at, you know, 10 o'clock uh, Wednesday night in the hotel and they're supposed to be studying, getting ready, you know, to go to bed early so we can wake up on Thursday and be ready for match day, um, you know, that they're on their own. And so having the culture and the expectations of how we do things – uh, is super important and you know all those kids that have gone through the program and graduated have certainly helped build it it's going to be here a while i'm really excited about what we have coming back here and what we have coming in and i i think that we could absolutely be better than we were last year uh, you know i think we've built those pieces but it took those first couple years to do it um it took the years of tripping hard uh, and grinding and finding ways to to push your team uh, without breaking them down, I feel like they just can't do it. Yeah. Did, um, and I just want to remind the audience, you guys, feel free to type in your questions. Uh, like I said, we're here till seven, and we'd love Tim to answer any questions. I will warn you that because of NCAA um, uh, certain rules that's, that came up May one, we cannot talk about anything about recruiting or anything about specific athletes. Uh, but any other question, I think, is pretty much to open. So feel free to ask. So uh, when I'd like to ask what you learned along the way from coaches at Pepperdine, what you learned, what what you took the most from Mick uh, at, at USC, and maybe before that, what what did you take from those coaches and that you still use today, and that you're you know that you're teaching you know now younger coaches? Sure. Um, you know, 
Well, Nina Matthews at Pepperdine was was a great mentor to me. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, competitor uh, who just absolutely lived and died in every point. Um, but the way she took care of her athletes, um, you know, I I always said I want to do that as well as she did. She she looked out for them, battled for them. She was their best advocate, uh, and I just thought she was super exceptional at that. Um, you know, and then going to Mick and SC, uh, you know, he really taught me the, the statistical side of the game and, and with all his Olympic experience and his international experience, you know, bro we sat down and broke down stats all day long uh, and just what mattered, what didn't matter, what were the tipping points again. And that's why, you know, your attack percentage and kill percentage are your, your top two things. Um, and that's at, certainly at the NC2A level. As you go down in the levels, it might be a little bit different. Um, but uh, that's all based on hard and fast research. And, you know, but taking that from Mick and, and his guidance on that and, and, you know, just he was a hard worker and he, he was a grinder and, and got after it every day. And, you know, those are all things that I tried to package and, and take the things I loved about Nina and the things I loved about Mick and kind of put them all together and, and, and create my own style of volleyball, if you will, or style of coaching. And then pass that on to uh, to my you know staff and and watch them go and start their own. Uh, Mark wants to know how have you how have you decided to move a player to another position or test their effectiveness in another role? It's a good question, Mark. Um, I think that it it depends on your team's needs. You know, if you're looking at moving a middle blocker to a pin hitter, uh, you got to see can she hit it. You know, can she hit that higher trajectory set, that non-first tempo? Um, and, and the best way to do it is you got to give yourself a couple days at it in practice. Um, in six-on-six -six scenarios, you can't you can make a knee-jerk reaction and see one ball and be like, oh, it's impossible, or oh, it's the greatest thing ever. You really got to look at it. Um, you know, we have a kid on our team who we started on the left last year, and then uh, we went through – and I just said, you know what, it's not gonna, that's not gonna be it. And we moved her into the libero position, and all the difference in the world for our team. But that was based on we'd seen her for a year and, and change and, and stat of the numbers. And I think it, it all depends what your team needs. Um, you know, in terms of point scoring, if you got a super physical athlete and you're playing them in the middle, and but you don't have the ball control or the setting to get him the ball you at least have to be creative on how you attack to get them more chances. Whether you set them a high ball in service Steve or in transition or whatever that might look like. Uh, but to move a kid in positions, you know, kind of depends what position it is. But I think you've got to experiment. I think a lot of kids get pigeonholed really early to being one thing. Uh, and I'm a huge believer that everyone's got to be able to do at least a little bit of everything. Um. Bill wants to know, going back to point scoring, what stats do you use for side out percent? Do you track points per rotation? What rotation do you start in? Or does it depend on points per rotation or side out percent or first ball side out per rotation? That's a long question. Bill's a That's right. I got you, Bill. I'm ready. Um, so <laughs> I, I absolutely track points per rotation, points won and lost per rotation. Uh, I track points won and lost by player, uh, points won and lost by rotation, by player by rotation, um, and you kind of put them all together, and then you'll start to see trends. So you'll see, you know, player X is really good hitting in row three, but she's not as good as if we flip the lineup, you know, and all of a sudden it'd be row six. Like, she's not as good in that personnel. So that's why I think it's really important you track it by rotation. Um, and then – you know, the old adage is if you're going to win by, by blitzing them to point, you want to start your best attackers in front row. Um, in college volleyball, on average, a match is going to get about 12 to 15 rotations. Uh, excuse me, a, a set. It's going to get 12 to 15 rotations per set. So you want to start your best attackers in front row so that they get the most looks, uh, the most opportunities. Uh, certainly in fifth sets, you want to look at always starting your best attacker in left front. The old adage is, are you trying to match up? Or are you just going to put your best attacker in left front? You know, and I, I've tried it both ways, and I've done it both ways, and I always go back to Nick Haley looking at me. 
Uh, I'll never forget it. We were on a road trip and we were going five. It's like, well, where do you want to start? And I was like, oh, I want to start here. And he looked at me. He's like, no, you always start with your best hitter and left front in the fifth set. And that's what we did when we won. So that that always just stuck with me. Um, so and, and the reason why I kind of believe that is if you're trying to match up, in the end, you don't know what they're going to do. So you could calculate the matchups and then they change and it's all out the window and you got your best hitter and right back. You got to wait till she gets all the way around. So. You know, you got to calculate the risk there, but I'm a big proponent of starting your best point score. That's why. Okay. Uh, Jordan has come back with another question. His question is basically, what do you want to see trained uh, in high school and club um, that'll give you more recruitable athletes? What, what, what can we do in the club system and the high school system to give you better athletes? Good question, Jordan. Uh, I think, having more quote unquote multi-sport kids. So, and the reason why I think that's important is because by playing sports, kids learn how to move. Okay, they learn how to move efficiently, how to change direction, how to run on arcs, how to, you know, be a little bit more dynamic and explosive. And that all comes from not just training the same thing. You know, uh, I grew up playing three high school sports and, and club sports and this and that. And it was just what we did. And I think time changed and generations have changed and kids are specializing really early so as kids are specializing I think it's important then maybe at the club level and the high school level is to make sure that they're getting a balanced diet of movement skills teaching them you know speed stuff how to run sprints proper jumping mechanics proper throwing mechanics you know how to throw a football uh, because a lot of that translates in how to hit a volleyball uh, so I think teaching a lot of those quote unquote basic athletic movements will help a lot. Um, and then the last part of it is, is let them play the whole game. You know, just because you're a middle blocker doesn't mean you have to come out. Of um, just because you're five, seven doesn't mean you can't play front row. Uh, so letting kids play the whole game and at least try and develop those skills, at least in practice. Um, I understand in matches you're trying to win and, and I totally get that. Uh, but at least helping them develop those things in practice. I mean, our middle blockers take service e uh in part of their breakouts. Um, just because I think it's important. Uh, you know, they learn how to set the non-setter ball, even though we usually have the libero or the DS come up and do it. But I still want them to know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, Anthony asked, what is the best way to manipulate points when you can't put the ball away effectively? Do you just focus on serve receive? Um, well, no, I would focus on transition and forcing opponents out of system. So if, if you have a team that really has a hard time putting the ball on the floor, I would become masters at attacking the opponent setter, um, so that they cannot be in system ever. And then you can keep working on those five shots we talked about and just try and be a better battle star out of system type team. Um, you know, we've played teams that have dominant middles, and sometimes our strategy is, hey, if you're not going to first ball kill, you're going to hit the ball at the setter, so that middle can't transition back at us. Um, so sometimes when you're on the attack, you're you're not always thinking about scoring. You're thinking about eliminating that counter attack. Okay. Uh, Caitlin wants to know, do you do anything specific to practice coming back from behind, like for points in the set or sets in a match? Absolutely. Uh, in some of our six-on-six six games, um, we play a game we call Blind Man's Bluff, um, and so we'll draw scores out of a hat. Um, so we put all these different scenarios into a hat. Captain draws one out, uh, and only our statistician gets to see it. Well, I don't even know what the score is, and the kids have to play. Uh, and it could be, you know, 14-14 in the fifth. It could be 19-13 in the first. They're all different scenarios we have written out. And what we're trying to do is teach them how to play at the same intensity all the time. So by not knowing what the score is, you kind of artificially force that. Uh, and then obviously we, we reward winners. And, uh, you know, if you're not victorious, you're doing some extra cardio or stuff like that. But we do lots of things like that. Uh, we play a game, um, you know, 18 to 4, 12, which means the score starts at 7 to 13. Um, and it forces the – the starting side or whatever side you are starting behind to have to get runs of points, you know, trying to get three in a row, 
to try and get that score back. But certainly in how you play your six-on-six -six games, you can create those different scoring scenarios. Um, another game we play is we'll just do a, a fifth set mock-up to 15, uh, but we'll play what we call the four air rule. So it's a normal set to 15 points, normal scoring, no extra balls, anything like that. But if your side creates four unforced errors, hitting air, serving the net, uh, then you lose no matter what, no matter what the score is. So you could be up 13 to five and lose. Um, so we create all different types of scenarios within that to try and teach our kids how to play, in my opinion, steady, no matter what the score is. You're playing the same yard at 0, zero as you are at 24 all. Okay. Uh, PJ, I got your question, but I'm going to tell you to actually just email uh, Tim directly with that question, okay? Mark wants to know, how much time are you spending talking with the players that aren't seeing the court much yet compared to your best players? Are you giving them specific roles to play on the sidelines? Yes, absolutely. I think every player has to know what their role is. Um, even if their role is, hey, you're, a, you know, our backup libero, so in practice, your job is to make the A-side work as hard as possible. Every kid's got to kind of know what their role is. And obviously, every kid wants to start and, and dominate, but that's just not reality. So making sure that they understand what their role is and making sure the team appreciates them for that role and you giving them the credit when they, when they deserve it is a big piece of that. Um, yes, absolutely, you got to talk to those kids. Um, I actually find myself during certain phases talking more to my non-starters than my starters. Okay. Uh, and I let my assistants work for my starters at, at those times. Peter wants to know, how do you keep evolving a successful program? For example, you have an undefeated or a low loss season, but multiple first round playoff losses. Uh, how do you keep evolving from there? Well, I think uh, you've got to try and segment the season. Um, you know, so we segment ours into preseason, then first round of conference, second round of conference, than the conference tournament. Uh, and you have very specific goals for those rounds. Uh, I think breaking things up like that, even if it sets, breaking it up, hey, first to five, first to ten, you know, breaking your season up, hey, we got six road matches in a row, let's take care of the first two, uh, and then we'll worry about the next two. But I think breaking things up into segments allows you to – uh, just evaluate, have the kids evaluate a little bit better instead of saying, hey, our whole season is based on we went to the quarterfinals or not. And you could be 25-0 and 0 and get upset, not get there, and then you feel like you didn't get your, your season accomplished. Uh, you know, I, I think breaking it up into segments or achievable smaller goals will then help you get the bigger goals you want. Okay. Andrew wants to know defensively, do you stick with one system, for example, perimeter or other, or do you change systems based on opponent or player ability? I think it depends on your roster. Um, I have done all of the above. I've played strictly rotation. I've played strictly perimeter read. I've changed it every night based on my personnel. But the bottom line is it's all on what your team is better at. It's better to play one defense exceptionally well, even if it's not the per perfect defense for everything, than to play two or three defenses mediocre. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. So it's going to depend on your personnel. If you have some great volleyball minds and high volleyball IQ in your team and they can change, do it. Um, what I have found when we have done that is I've only told the people who are going to make the very specific change what they're doing, whether I'm going to drop my left back into the corner or I'm going to play right back under. I'll kind of only tell those people so I don't cloud the minds of everyone else with stuff that doesn't really affect them. Okay. Uh, Jordan is back. He wants to know, how do you balance process versus result as you're training kids to compete? Great question. Uh, for us, it is all about the process. Uh, and the reason why we stick with that so much is if you get the process right, the results are going to come. You know, if you do the process right, you're going to get the result eight out of ten times. Um, and that is part of the reason why we don't give a ton of feedback in the six on six phase because we want them to compete um, and feel free. We focus on the process side really heavily in the training block segment. Um, and then when they get to the six on six, we just want them to compete. 
Um, and then we'll go back to the process when we get to video and things like that. But getting them to trust the process is a big deal and it's hard. Um, you know, kids want things and they want them to work the first time. And if it doesn't, they want to know why it didn't work. It's, it's all about them buying into, hey, it's going to take time. But if you do these steps, A, B, and C, you're going to get to the, to where you are. Okay. I just want to remind the attendees, we've got about five minutes left. So if you've got any last questions, get them in here quick. Uh, Mark wants to know, do you have scenarios where you tend to go to back row attacks more often? Absolutely. Um, if opponents, if we're out of system or scrambling and opponents are optioning down to a specific hitter, uh, like when we were at SC, opponents would option down to Samantha Bricio a lot. We would then run the back row to, to catch them cheating, you know, catch their middle blocker, kind of leaving that zone. So depending what the opponents are doing, uh, certainly we'd go to back row more than other times. Have you ever had a season where the expectations were incredibly high, where um, you know the, the predictions were high, you thought it was going to be a great season, and then it just, for whatever reason, spiraled out of control? What what was the reason? I'm trying to trying to pinpoint if there's one season for you that you can think about. And then if you did have that season, what was the reason? For was it injuries? Was it chemistry? Was it culture? What was the reason? Sure, I did have one of those actually. Uh, my first year at Pepperdine, uh, they had pretty high expectations going in. Uh, we were picked to finish one or two in the conference, and we didn't even make the NCAA tournament. We had a losing record. Uh, and for that particular case, it was injury. Um, you know, we lost our starting setter, we lost the middle blocker, we lost two outside hitters. And they were all like freak accidents. Only one of them happened playing volleyball, I think. Wow. You know, a kid tripped downstairs, all sorts of weird stuff. Um, and, but I still learned so much in that season. I mean, we beat UCLA at Poly Pavilion that year, and we had no business beating them. I mean, none. Uh, we had a libero playing on the left. We had a backup setter hit on the right. We had a middle blocker playing who literally couldn't hit. She was only allowed to tip. Uh, because she had a banged up arm, uh, and we, I still learned a ton from that season, but a lot of it was injury based. Uh, but we certainly found some new and creative ways to try and keep kids motivated in training and, and grinding. Uh, PJ wants to know do you struggle with kids sometimes not competing to what you think is at their best ability, and how do you get them out of their own heads? Uh, I've certainly seen it, there's no question. Um, I think that what I have found the best is you got to communicate with them, uh, talk to them and let them know, Hey, you know, I think you have so much more. I think you can get to this next level, uh, whether it's they're overthinking it, whether it's they're not practicing enough, you know, I don't know what that their particular case is, but for me, a lot of it was just kids overthinking, um, you know, paralysis by analysis they're trying to do it perfect every time they're analyzing everything and then they do it wrong every time um you know you got to let them get out there and and try and let them play and that's why again when we get to our six on six stuff we try not to give too much feedback we'll give a little bit here a little bit there uh but we really want them to focus on the competing the winning and quite honestly they're having fun they have to enjoy playing and the more fun they have on the court, the more they're going to listen to you in the skill breakouts in the training segment uh, to then focus on what you're trying to get. And then, you know, you reward them by letting them play six on six again, and they're more successful. And then it kind of cycles and feeds itself. Okay. Uh, Andrew wants to know, what are your thoughts on the newer evidence supporting middle-middle defense? Well, you know, I think it's all based on your blocking scheme and what you're trying to take away. Um, you know, I, I've talked to numerous coaches about playing libero and left back, playing libero and middle back, and, and why we do it the way we do it. Um, I like playing my libero and left back personally because that caters to our blocking scheme and what we're taking away and where we're putting the ball. Um, I've also been really blessed in my coaching career to, to have coached some incredible liberos, uh, you know, in the past. And, and so I like them in the left back where I kind of had that, and so we've just grown up with that system. Uh, I also like having the big back row option when you're playing your libero and middle back. It just gets a little more complicated. It's not impossible. Um, but I, I think it's certainly a valid way to play defense. Again, I don't think there's any one way to play this game. I think there's a million different ways to skin the cat. If you look across the world, China's 
different than Italy, and Italy's playing different than Brazil, uh, you know, and, and Poland's good, and Turkey, and Netherlands, and they all play their own brand. Um, and there's no one right, wrong way to do it. It's are they executing their system as good as they can, and is your system then maximizing their talent? So I think if you've got a great middle back defender, absolutely funnel the ball to middle back. Uh, if you have a great left back defender, funnel the ball to left back. I, you know, that part I don't think matters as much. Okay. This will be the last question. Um, attendees, I want to thank everybody. Tim, I want to thank you, of course. Um, if there were three takeaways for our coaches that you wanted to give them uh, to be better coaches, uh, coaching this game. What would be, would be the three things as they leave here that you'd want them to, to be able to take with them? Sure. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, coaching is communicating. So be elite communicators with your players. Um, and especially in the heat of the moment, when the chips are down and it really matters, um, I think being able to communicate effectively uh, at what you want uh, is a big deal. Uh, and then secondly, we'll get back to kind of the point scoring thing here, I think is giving your teams a strategy both in system and out of system. What exactly are they trying to accomplish in system? You know, it's not just put it on the floor, but it's, hey, we're trying to isolate this blocker here to get this, you know, kid one-on-one. -on -one. Or we're trying to, to get this middle blocker stuck here so we have a good spot over here. Or we're trying to set the middle ton. Uh, and then, you know, out of system, it's give them a strategy. Hey, let's go with these three or four great shots. Let's get good at our out-of-system setting uh, and, and give your kids an opportunity to understand what they're trying to execute. So, you know, again, I think being elite communicators and then giving them specifics for what your offensive system is trying to do and then give them a plan for when they're out of system. Perfect. Uh, Tim, I want to thank you very, very much for your time tonight. Uh, attendees, thank you guys very much for attending. I apologize for the rough start. The first time we did this, we learned a lot. Uh, we'll be better tomorrow. We've got uh, Sonia Tomasevich from uh, ASU tomorrow at 6 p.m. So uh, those of you who want to sign, uh, signed up, if you haven't, please feel free to sign up. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, Tim, is, Tim, your email, if you want to take some questions from them. Yeah, absolutely. My email is tim.nolan, N-O-L-L-A-N, at gcu.edu. Okay. And are you guys doing camps or you got shut down? We are shut down for this summer, unfortunately. But uh, okay. we'll be back to running a camp probably in January, assuming everything's on the up and up, and then back again in the summer of 21. That sounds great. Tim, I appreciate it very, very much. Gil, uh, our, uh, our uh, technician, thank you very much for your help today. And uh, all the attendees, thanks for joining us. And uh, have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Take care.